So um, uh, today we are looking at two novels, uh, Trevor Noah's uh, Born a Crime, the South African uh, memoir of uh, the bicultural Trevor Noah, as well as, uh, so this is a memoir, uh, Born a Crime, that's a memoir, so the genre itself uh, can be problematized. And uh, the second one is uh, Saud Al Sanusi's um, translated novel, The Bamboo Stalk, um, which also tells the story of a bicultural uh, character. Yeah. And um, yeah, so, so we, we're going to get started. Um, who would like to go first? I'll go first, Doctor. Sure. Okay. Um, so yes, so uh, the issue of identity, I think is very strong. I think all of us can collectively agree on that. Uh, but then um, what is interesting is actually the denunciation of identity by other people. Okay, how do I spell that denunciation? But I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, okay? So we have um, characters who from the beginning, oh, when I say characters, I mean uh, the main characters in uh, Born a Crime and the Bamboo Stock. I um, mean, bicultural, uh, of different, of different heritage. I wouldn't say different nationality. I don't think their nationality was ever um, doubted. I think the, you know, their heritage uh, are actually uh, being conflicted against each other without their consent. Uh, so growing up, they never really have. Um, any say in uh, who they are, who they are have always been imposed upon by others. And when I when we say others, it's unfortunately the family members. Um, uh, so I think what struck me the most um, are the roles of the grandparents more than the parents themselves. So in uh, the bamboo stock, we have because I just read that, so it's still fresh in my mind. We have the grandmothers, you know, grandmothers of Asia and of and of Africans. I think are of a certain species compared to the Western uh, perspective. So we have the, the Kuwaiti grandmother uh, who, who has this very strong push and pull. Um, uh, you, you, you sound like my son, but you have a Filipino face. Uh, so the, uh, the grandmother recognized and disowned uh, him at the same time, Isa. I'm not sure why I prefer to call him Jose, but Isala, because he's asserting that at the end of the novel. At the same time, if you compare it to um, uh, Trevor Noah, uh, what struck me the most is actually uh, the grandmother calling him white, even when he doesn't think of himself as white. And uh, historically speaking, when, uh, if, when you look at literature, a lot of mixed blood uh, uh, individuals, especially in America, uh, because of that one drop law, uh, a lot of mixed blood had to consider themselves black in America and obviously American Americans dominate the global narrative. Uh, so that is interesting for me to see how the grandmother telling um, the grandsons, you are who I think you are. It doesn't matter how you define your identities. Uh, so as if they are carrying the burden of their viewpoints from their uh, generation. Uh, so, but then I think the bamboo stock is different in a sense that um, Isa is a lot more assertive. I do think because he has been, because he literally was transported into a different land. So there are a few passages actually. Can I just share my screen if you don't mind? Uh, okay, let me just share my very pathetic Microsoft Word. <laughs> okay, so there are three passages that I got. Literally, I just got them. I just extracted them uh, this morning. So the first one, I think the first 200 pages of the book, um, he is still quite, um, uh, he floats about between these two identities. Obviously, the Filipino identity is a lot stronger and tangible because of his upbringing. Uh, but then the mother also feeds him this, think about, oh, you know, you will return to Kuwait, you will be a Muslim and you will practice the identity of your father. However, later I noticed after, uh, you know, late, you know, a while later when the Kuwaiti family, upon, upon him being settling there and when the Kuwaiti family started to disown him, then 
as a reaction, he started to actually assert uh, the Kuwaiti identity that he inherited. So he kept on saying, Isa, I am Isa Rashid Al Taruf, and the family name uh, suddenly holds a lot of importance for him lah, after being denounced or, and, and somewhat being exiled from the, from the family um, that he himself um, didn't really know or didn't really get familiar with lah. So I so I'm I'm really interested in how that transition happened, um, how much he felt the need to attach himself to his um, father's identity despite not having met his father before. All right. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to stop sharing. So yeah. So that is the main thing that I see lah. I see uh, our characters struggling to define who they are. Uh, so that is the internal part. And then what, ha what is happening externally um, is related, but somewhat of a different magnitude. Uh, because internally, there's agency and choice uh, of you accepting who you are. But externally, um, it is really cultural, familial, uh, and if in, in Trevor Noah's case, legal. Uh, I think in Kuwait, there's also legal, but I think in Kuwait, it was a lot easier for him legally, uh, but then a lot harder personally. But for Trevor Noah, family was never, um, he never doubted his mother's love and his father's care. But then legally, it was a problem. So it was a really interesting contrast for me. Um, they are dealing with similar things, but in a different way. So yeah, so that is my take on it. Lah. Um, okay, um, very quickly, uh, before I forget, so um, when you talk about the, the, the denunciation of uh, identity by the other, uh, mm. the, first, the first concept that came to mind was recognition, uh, or in this case, misrecognition. So uh, mm. the, two, the two articles that I have attached in our chat line, uh, in our chat, in, in current chat, um, um, is this the first one is misrecognition and cross-cultural understanding so so the idea is that you know your your sense of identity especially your public sense of identity it does require a level of recognition or sense of um, acceptance by 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 your community by uh, the public generally right so when you're mm. not accepted for your sense of identity, uh, the opposite is true. It, there is a level of misrecognition. So this mm. article kind of problematizes that. Um, uh, uh, taking up um, Charles Taylor's uh, discussion on the politics of recognition and Nancy Frazier's um, problematizing of it, especially within the context of uh, justice and and you know uh, how misrecognition um, affects the participation especially minorities participation but in the case of Jose and Trevor uh, uh, the misrecognition creates a kind of othering right yeah. so, so that is something you may want to kind of uh, uh, focus on so the two articles are there yes uh, so just tighten the argument uh, uh, into a kind of a thesis and then just upload it on, on UKM Folio. All right. Thank you so much, Doctor. So, so I, I love that you managed to uh, uh, provide me with a term uh, or with a theory that I can uh, develop further. Because Thank I you. used that for my PhD. I used politics oh. of recognition was one of the... Um, uh, my one of the conceptual uh, one of the concepts for my conceptual framework. So I'm, I'm familiar. This is to identity politics as well, doctor, isn't it? Yes, very much. But it is at the public domain, not at a private domain. So minorities, especially, uh, they demand for their recognition, their sense of identity to be, to be number one, recognized, uh, and that recognition is translated in the form of government policy. So that's where the discourse of multiculturalism comes in, the management of diversity. Yeah. So a simple fact like uh, your your uh, racial heritage, cultural heritage is given a space in the public domain that you are able to set up your places of worship. Uh, the celebration that you want to have uh, is given recognition. That in itself 
shows recognition for that particular ethnic community. But in the case of um, Jose, if you are caught between the two, which identity is recognized? So in this case, it's misrecognized. Lah. So you can, oh. you can uh, pursue that. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you. Yeah. Next. Salim? Yes, doctor. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, uh, I've uh, concentrated on the issue of blessing and cares at the same time. And what happened to Isa is not something new. When I when I when I read the, when I have read the the the, the, the novel, uh, I didn't feel that that it's that it's something strange. In fact, uh, uh, bear, giving birth to a child by uh, a father who is uh, by, by by different parents from different nationality usually bring two things: blessing and cares at the same time. A friend of mine, his name was Muhammad. He traveled to uh, to UK, and the other time it was let me say it was in. 2001, 1999, uh, 1999, 2001. He traveled to to UK. Uh, he immigrated to UK. In fact, by illegal ways, as you know, this is what happened to uh, countries who, uh, that have issues, political issues. So he got married to a, a lady from UK, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, he he got two two kids. But the problem with the two kids, in Britain, we have two types of people, the black hair people and the blonde hair people. Uh, the, the people with the black eyes, uh, which are people from the Middle East in most cases, and the people, people of uh, Europe uh, in Britain, and they are blonde uh, with the blonde hair and uh, blue eyes. So whenever they go, they usually, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was as a as a curse for them. Mm -hmm. Oh, black man, black men came, black men came, black. So they, they usually, you know, uh, uh, say something bad to them, you know. And even the mother, when she said, when 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 I go to the market, and people saw that I'm carrying two kids, uh, I, I'm one of one of uh, holding a kid, and uh, uh, taking the hand of another one, and they are different. Uh, with the color, with the uh, the color of the eyes, I mean, and and the the the, the color of their the the hair. Uh, so this bring lots of problems for me. Uh, and the mother says that when I go to a market, they said, "Oh, look at that man! She got married to uh, someone who is not from our nationality," and she felt I, I felt insulted whenever I go. So. In, in what happened to Isa, in my opinion, it was two things, a blessing and curse. For the family, it was a curse because uh, the aunt, uh, uh, and I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, yeah, lost the election because of what? Because of, uh, uh, of uh, Isa, or, or, or uh, the, the, the son of Josephine. So uh, uh, people, uh, the, the care started to, 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 to follow the family due to what? Due to Isa. I do believe that the two issues that uh, uh, I discussed them, inshallah, I'm going to discuss them, uh, giving birth between curse and blessing is really something thinkable, and inshallah, it's going to be something new. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Okay, I, I think I will listen to everyone first so that I can show you um, the, the search uh, more more clearly later. So thank you, Salim. I'll come back to you in a minute. I've got some thoughts for your for your uh, topic. Who would like to go next? Can I go next? Oh, oh. <laughs> who, who would like to go next? 
Uh, I'm okay, Doctor Lisa. Go first. I'm I'm okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. You can go first. <laughs> <laughs> you stop being so Asian, lah, you people. Okay, who wants to go next? <laughs> okay, Alice, go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you, Doctor. Mm. Uh, uh, when I read a uh, born uh, from. Uh, first, I see the inequality in the book uh, as a hybrid of uh, black and uh, white. A uh, traveler was born illegally. Uh, there is an uh, inequality of uh, black people in the book. Uh, first, a uh, white people hardly got punishment when he is found. A white man hardly got a uh, uh, hardly got punishment when he is found for uh, for in love with a black woman. Uh, but a black man is found with when the, uh, a black man is found with a white white woman, he's probably accused of rape. Uh, second is the right of uh, the right of uh, the black people. Uh, when is uh, I'm very surprised that uh, uh, the author said in the book that uh, when come to the transportation, uh, black people cannot uh, take the uh, the bus with uh, white people, uh, so, so they uh, how to, um, so they have their own mini mini bus, which is uh, illegal and uh, is not uh, punctual and uh, safe. Uh, and uh, uh, second, I see is a uh, uh, struggle of identity. Uh, uh, for Trevor, he spent much of his time indoors, uh, out of his mother's fear, uh, so um, so uh, that he would be taken by the government, uh, because uh, his birth is illegal. Uh, and when Trevor uh, did uh, went to school, uh, he was uh, the one that was different. Uh, he's uh, he isn't white and he isn't black. Uh, but uh, he's in between, uh, so uh, he struggled with uh, his identity. Uh, uh, he was both black and white in his country, and uh, and uh, mm, he can. Uh, it's uh, very difficult for he to find his uh, existence. Uh, it's uh, uh, so mm, the problem is uh, how can one belong if uh, they are supposed to, they aren't supposed to exist mm. and uh, for for the bamboo stalk uh, is uh, mm, is a uh, also the uh, struggle uh, ident identity struggle of hybrid uh, first I'm very interested in the name of the book uh, why, why, why the uh, book is uh, bam the name is bamboo stalk uh, uh, we're reading it. Uh, uh, bamboo stalk is easily to grow. Where you put it, it in the ground, where it can grow quickly. Uh, Joe is like the bamboo stalk. He was born in court, court, uh, court but uh, uh, moved to the uh, Philippines with his, uh, her mother, who was a uh, uh, Filipino. But uh, uh, she was a uh, servant in a rich family in. Uh, quote, uh, quote, uh, she fall in love with the uh, uh, Joe's father, uh, who was her master in the rich family. So Joe's uh, was half Quati and half Filipino. Uh, he could he could never choose this himself. But the issue is that man cannot just like a bamboo stalk, which grows wherever others put them. Joe's Joe's is a uh, uh, Josie as a uh, human being has his uh, own thought and uh, he needs his own identity. But as a hybrid, he can't make, make his, uh, uh, he can't make uh, his identity very clear uh, in this story. Mm. Uh, just as uh, his two names, uh, Josie and Isa, the book are divided into two parts, uh, half uh, covered, uh, co uh, Kuwati and uh, half Filipino. Uh, though he was brought up in the uh, Philippines, 
where most of the people are Christian. His mother promised that uh, he should belong to Quad and uh, not a Philippines. So that means uh, he should follow his father as a Muslim. And uh, his father was from a rich family, uh, lack of boys. As a child, Josie was uh, jo Jos was uh, taught that uh, he would go back to Quad and uh, become the son of his father. He didn't belong to the Philippines and he will be a rich Muslim one day in, in his father's country. And uh, at the second part of the book, uh, he went, went back to uh, his father's country, but things didn't go as uh, her mother had promised before. Uh, his family were not, uh, uh, not well welcoming. Uh, some of uh, his family wanted wanted to deny him complete, completely, and uh, for him to return the Philipp Philippine advice. Uh, while others wanted him to keep a low profile, uh, uh, Isa and uh, a few others make a considerable uh, references to the social sculpture of a uh, quad, whereby unless you are true quality. Uh, both parents are uh, quality. You are considered an um, uh, outcast. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is uh, is uh, is a quality or his uh, Filipino? Uh, he struggle with uh, religion, fleeting with uh, uh, Buddhism to escape the Filipino Christianity and uh, the quality Islam. So, uh, his his. Uh, his cousin, um, Mala, uh, who uh, who is uh, who is the child of a Filipina woman and uh, a, a Noah European, uh, also st uh, struggles with her identity. Uh, so, um, it's um, it's very hard for a, a hybrid to uh, make uh, he or her identity clear. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, next. Oh, okay. Uh, so one of the things that I found interesting is that this book, uh, usually, uh, like, for example, in Kevin Powers' book, the other ring was usually someone from the Middle East and the American takes like a high seat. But for this book particularly, uh, the other ring was people from the Philippines. So that's what I found interesting. So the author, did, you kind of have see, you kind of see like what it's like when uh, when a person who's not uh, who's like who, who's you say superior economic wise or whatever from like the third world country they pick on their book. So the author did uh, he has his own perception on uh, prostitution, how it's bad and whatnot. But he did acknowledge that it was due to the poverty of the nation. So uh, I can't say that he's biased or anything because that is like the truth of the the truth of what Philippines is like. The same way that uh, I wasn't really mad how Kevin Powers described the people, how their people describe um, the people of the Middle East, because uh, that's the truth. That's the truth of the. Uh, that's the truth, how it was back then, that, that that's how, what the people's opinions really are, regardless of this. Uh, another thing is, um, I find it interesting how people, uh, the concept of identity, how people can take your power by taking your name away from you. It's not only just in the bamboo stock, but also in the heat you give as well as uh, Trevor Noah's book as well. Uh, I wonder why it is that uh, for them, like, uh, for them to assimilate with their uh, with the culture, America, Britain, or wherever they are, uh, they have to change the the, the the name and make it more like English or more American sounding. When the the name in their own language has a significant meaning to them, uh, it makes me wonder like if if the people, the Americans or Britons, won't care enough to learn their names in the language that it was given to them by. Why would they care enough to uh, care enough about the livelihood of the people? Is it like such a hard thing to how say to stick to the names given? You just just call them by their name, by their language. Yeah, so I think that's like one of the interesting issues 
that could unpack. And another one is um, usually in this story, so I would say it reminds me of like the movies, like where people go. They call it like the American dream, like right? they go to this uh, nation that uh, to make a better life of themselves. And the movie always has a happy ending, like they struggle, struggle, and then you find that the main character would find success in the end. But in this book, it's kind of like very dreary because uh, the ending is kind of like he, <laughs> the character is left hanging a bit. So yeah. So, so I think it's a very realistic book. You might not find it like interesting or whatnot because uh, you want, as, as a reader, you want a happy ending, but no, like, no, uh, no one's journey is ever like that in real life, right? Yeah, so that's it. Who wants to go next? Uh, it reminds me of, um, sorry, doctor, <laughs> sorry to interrupt, okay. but it reminds me of, um, have you watched uh, Studio Ghibli's a spirited away because that that grandmother yes, also yes. takes away the name of yeah, yeah hero becomes what said <laughs> yeah. okay can i suddenly you can compare it with with an animation now <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. because you have identified a particular theme in this particular text that you can see mm. the intertextuality with another text right yeah. so yeah good yeah but um, and also the character of grandma there <laughs> Right, okay, so can I go next? It's My note is, is a bit here and there, but okay. Um, first, I would say, of course, identity, and then I also see, you know, a bit of religion, but okay, I'll just go. Um, also, the line, quite is a small place, is, is very much, you know, um, um, repeated in, in the novel. And then... Um, what was the line again? Sorry? Uh, quite is a small place. Right, right in the in the in the novel. Um, so, what I can compare is that uh, during their coming of age, this this protagonist, they question uh, and and was in search of a place where they belong somewhat. Um, so in this case, because I, I will very much lean on them will stop because it's very fresh, like Ruby said. <laughs> um, so quite a Philippines, right? To me personally, as much as he belong in the Philippines, it gave so much like headache and heartache uh, but if he was in quiet it was a different kind of headache and heartache um, so all involved either his family on mother's side being the problem or his father's side um, which both grandparents are so amusing to look at um, so when he was in the philippines his mother would frequently address him as isa which he did not prefer so uh, he preferred jose as his identity right um, but when he came to Kuwait, very, he very much wanted to prove how he was, you know, Isa um, Rashid uh, Taruf. Um, it, it is not that he did not belong anywhere to me. It's just, I think he belonged to neither of these places. Since both of these places has its own, uh, its own kind of like destructive force towards him. So, um, yeah, he needed to make peace with that. That's why, uh, you know, at the end of the novel, then only we see him. Uh, you know, like that. And then one thing for sure, wherever he was put, that say any place in the Philippines or Kauai, um, he survived regardless, same as um, Trevor, Trevor as well. Um, it's, it's like a sense of, uh, you know, survival, I would say. Um, and then uh, just a bit on religion, I think um, as much as the, the writers... Um, put in, you know, Islam, Christianity, or, or Buddha, it is as if, you know, it's it's something they could hold on to while, while going through so much. Um, like uh, like Isa, um, I feel like he, he was always lonely, so he just needed, like, affirmation that at least God was present and, and could listen, any God by any means, yeah. And then... Um, what else did I read? Uh, okay, right. One, yeah. Uh, character development is very much uh, interesting in, in, in Bamboo Stock. And I actually like when um, the stories are in Philippines compared to Kuwait when he was in uh, Philippines. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's all, I think. And how would how would that be comparable with uh, Trevor Noah's Born a Crime? Uh, I think um, in terms of like religion, his mother is very much um, a, a Christian. How do you say this? 
what's the word? His, his, basically, his mother is very much, uh, you know, um, because when we first read the story, we were, um, we were told that there's different church for different kind of community, but his mother, you know, his mother very well informed him about that. So Christianity, I think, being part of his life and, and it's as if it's something that his mother, you know, actually holds on to while, you know, surviving and going through hell. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a sense of religion that that connects, but it also disjoins. In Isa's case, yeah. religion disjoins him, yeah. whereas else in Trevor's case, religion joins him or connects him to his his roots, even though he's bicultural. Ah, uh, doctor, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Sorry, sorry. Am I? Am I? Is my volume okay? Okay. Oh, maybe it's just me. Okay, sorry. Okay. No, because what you were saying about religion, in Isa's case, religion mm -hmm. appears to create a kind of a disjointed identity, a fracture mm -hmm. in his identity, right? Yeah. Uh, because at times he is Muslim when he's in Kuwait and yeah. when he is in um, the Philippines, it's majority Christian. So he, he's like disjointed. His sense of identity is not only disjointed culturally, mm -hmm. racially, mm -hmm ethnically, you know, in terms of his sense of nationhood also, yeah. but also religiously. Where mm -hmm. else in Trevor's case, religion is the one thing that connects him yeah. to his his grandparents, his, yeah. Yeah. his family, you know, because they are all Christians. Yeah. So there is that theme of disjointed identity rooted in religion and also because of religion, Mm -hmm. that bicultural individual finds some kind of rootedness, right? So, yeah. so we can play with that idea because you have on the one hand, Isa Jose is bicultural, uh, Trevor is also bicultural, but because of there is a consistency of religion, mm -hmm. in the case of Trevor, his bicultural identity does not affect his psyche, his mm. sense of belonging, mm. yeah? Where else Isa or Jose does not have that. Mm. He doesn't have that privilege of having that one thing that joins yeah. him to yeah. his, his family, his parents, his, yeah? Yeah. yeah. So, Thank you, Doctor, for putting it so well. <laughs> Can I just add something that I find Shah said to be very fascinating? Mm. Uh, because in the beginning, Shah said, um, in the novel, The Bamboo Stock, um, the country is very small. Uh, Kuwait is very small. So I notice uh, how uh, both writers, they are very, they are very, how to say, uh, they are very concerned about space, maybe because in their own upbringing, space has been fractured. Uh, in Philippines, there's this um, slum area, is it, is it okay to call it the slum area, and then the rich people area. And then in Kuwait, even though it's small, there's the migrant area. And then there's the Kuwait, you know, the, the Arab Kuwait uh, area as well. So when you say about space, then it started, it got me thinking about how it is being used as, uh, you know, the identities transcends or perhaps penetrates different spaces of different classes. Oh, actually, uh, sorry, sorry, I have to put my uh, own input in there. What Ruby said is very interesting. The concept of space how, and how it cannot be, how say, cannot be inherited by other people. Their space is their space, it's not anyone else. You're either this or you're that. There's no like, third space, there's no mingling in between. Even though like Isa's name was technically like Jesus, like right in the Christian, in the Christian context, but uh, it wasn't accepted because you're either a Christian or, or, or you're not. And also, you're either white or you're black. That's it. There's no like, there's no in between. So like, I think the concept of like space is very interesting. It's really good. Yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, I mean, um, when I read the bamboo stalk, at first I was interested in Jose or Issa's character, but then there's a part where Mila actually mentioned how she uses her bicultural identity or her beauty to actually uh, manipulate the men. And this situation actually reminds me of Trevor Noah's situation when he acted 
as what people perceive him to be the mixed colored gangster so i would say that in this case they are using their bicultural identity on uh, for their own benefit however in the terms of isa he couldn't do that and at at first i wonder why he didn't use his bicultural identity then i realized what trevor noah and also um um her uh, what's the cousin Merla's has uh, Merla has in common have in common is actually the way they look. Merla actually look a little bit um, like his European nameless European father, and so did Trevor Noah with his white skin. But in but in case of um, Jose or Isa, he look nothing like his father. He only possessed the voice of his father, but he look philippine now the the conflict of jose or isa is very difficult because first he um by um according to his um, passport he is a quite but he looks philippine however even though he owns the quite passport he is not accepted in the quite in the quite but if he, i wonder if he returns back to the philippine would he have would he has the same right as the philippine people because according to his passport he's a quiet so i wonder what rights he actually has in his life since even in quiet he could not get a decent job because um he has no education and he doesn't look like a quiet he's not accepted in his family but back in the philippine i wonder what kind of um rights are offered to him as a biculture, a bicultural um, kid. So um, it's something that I ponder about. And I also uh, wonder why um, Jose or Isa insisted on getting to know the quiet as a whole, but he also confuses himself because to him, he kept on repeating that quiet has so many different faces depending on the people he met because different people he met treats him differently. Mm. So to me, judging a country as a whole is not possible because uh, a lot of people, they have their own different personality, but that is what actually Isa is trying to do. He's trying to understand quiet as a whole, even though it's impossible. But in the conclusion, I think he understands that he did not belong, uh, he, he wanted to be in quiet, but he know that majority, based on his experience, he is not welcome there. So that's like a very sad ending, but it's the truth. And then I'm also interested in Gassan, who is a Bidun. He served in the army, um, he lived there, he was born there. And the most interesting part is actually he had siblings who have the quiet nationality except for him. The only error in the system where he is considered as a bidon. Now, this actually reminds me um, of um, my friend's um, my friend's friend situation, where all of her siblings are accepted as uh, Malaysian national uh, as Malaysians, but only her, and this has caused her very um, very great disturbance in her education because she couldn't land any. Um, spot in Malaysian education, she had to go to Thailand for that. Only her alone, even though her parents are both now considered as Malaysian. So I'm sorry, I have to, uh, why wasn't she given citizenship? I do not know why. But I both parents have citizenships. Yeah, her siblings all have citizenship except for her. Hmm. Okay, I'm just asking because yeah, I just wanted to know why. Yeah. So um, coming back, I think like when you bicultural, what benefits you is when you look <laughs> um, based on these two novels, um, Born a Crime and also um, The Bamboo Stock. If you, you have, what I understand is if you have bicultural identity, what I came to the conclusion is when you have a bicultural identity, if you look a certain way, you can apply the benefits that you have. But if you look only um, like a part of your bicultural identity, then you might end up like Issa or Jose. So um, that's why I got from both stories. Okay, thank you. Uh, did we miss anybody? No, we didn't. Um, 
I, I think uh, it's it's fair to say that we all agree uh, the the two novels deal with the identity issue uh, well. Yeah, uh, there is uh, the uh, the various dimensions of identity. You've got identity at the personal level as well as identity at the public level. So the minute you go into the public realm, there is a power struggle. That's when the politics associated with identity comes in. So you may have um, uh, various dimensions of um, the politics of identity. You may have um, uh, politics of naming or, or how naming can create empowerment and disempowerment. Um, how you know this idea of uh, the politics creates inequality based on race as. Um, As Dong Lai was saying, uh, as Alice was saying, this idea of inequality. I've got a sneeze coming up, but it didn't want to come up. Um, and then uh, you also have sense of identity that is uh, neither here nor there. Uh, you know, I think Shah talked about it a little bit. Lisa also talked about it a little bit. Uh, this uh, and even Salim talked about it. So you you all talked about it, but you named it differently. Salim named this sense of uh, hybrid identity as uh, either a curse. You know, there is a kind of a, a, a kind of a contestation of identity seen as a curse. So you may look at it as a social curse and how um, that sense of identity that is seen as a curse manifest into your social um, inequalities, yeah? your, the lack of, of opportunities because of your identity, because of that third space identity that you belong. And as um, um, Aimee talked about just now, how whatever is on your passport, it does not necessarily translate into um, Another concept that I think it's worth looking into is um, Benedict Anderson's notion of uh, the imagined community, where uh, you know, you know, your sense of belonging to a particular community, it's not because you know everybody in that community, but because in your psyche and in the psyche of the people of that community, you share certain things. You share the language, you share uh, the religion, you may share the, the practices, the cultural practices, uh, the, the way of life that you um, uh, live and the way of life that people of your community live. So that creates what Anderson uh, Benedict talks about, Benedict Anton talks about, this sense of an imagined community. And when you have that, that concept in your mind that you know you belong to this particular community, whether or not you know the members well, because of that uh, um, connection and association, in your mind, you know that you belong to them or they belong to you and they accept that you are part of them. When there is that level of acceptance, recognition, the individual experiences a kind of belonging, right? So the belonging is very much an abstract concept. Like, but what Aini talks about just now is when you have a passport, there is a concrete uh, evidence that shows you are a member of this nation because this passport has your name and you are, uh, your nationality is clearly stated in that passport. But how does that concrete thing translate into your, um, your sense of identity, your psyche, your acceptance? And that's where concepts like the imagined community uh, is necessary, right? So in nations when, uh, uh, you know, the nation experiences independence, goes from a colonial uh, state to a, a post-colonial state, the nation, uh, the, the, the authorities, the government need to do certain things in order to ensure that the nation uh, as a whole, the people of the nation as a whole, uh, associates themselves to the collective uh, identity. 
then you have things like uh, the national language, you speak one language, or you celebrate uh, similar, um, um, uh, you know, holidays like um, Independence Day or Malaysia Day. And, and you know, you have certain things that, that joins you together as members of that particular uh, land. So there is that level of the imagined community in the minds of all Malaysians that allows them to be united. So when you compare that to the text, in Jose's case, his level of the imagined community is non-existent, right? There isn't, there isn't a, a, an imagined community that he fits into. Uh, albeit, as uh, Aimee said, uh, Merla has the same kind of, um, he, she is from the same kind of situation or context, but it doesn't seem to affect her as much. So I'm just wondering though, um, is there a level of choice uh, that both novels seem to, uh, both texts rather, because one is a novel, another one is a memoir. Is there a level of choice that the author themselves seem to suggest? The two authors, do they suggest certain things? You know, Because we're not expecting to find resolution um uh, you're right lisa you're right there is no resolution the lack of resolution in um uh, the bamboo stalk uh, almost suggests that such individuals uh, their lives are constantly in a state of a limbo you know they are uncertain whether they are rooted in in their parents uh, in their dad's cultural sensibilities or their mom's cultural sensibilities right so whoever is dominant. But if they were together, if they were a married couple and they were together and they chose to raise the family Muslim or they chose to raise the family Christian, that's a different case. But in, uh, in Isa's case, in Jose's case, the upbringing was also missing. So if you remove all those, um, you know, the mechanisms that makes an individual whole, what does the story suggest? So if you have that uh, in uh, Born a Crime, the mother makes a point to raise Trevor, uh, to, to ensure that he attends school, he attends church, he is part of a community, even if he is not seen as a member of the community. So the community doesn't recognize him as a member of the community because they always see him as different in born a crime however because of the mother's obstinate to ensure that she gives him a kind of an upbringing that joins him to a particular community uh, it allows trevor as you all have said last week some of you have said last week it allows trevor to kind of get to know the other communities without a sense of insecurity right so Jose could have done that. Jose could have chosen to learn Arabic and learn the Filipino tongue, the Tagalog, and be able to speak both proficiently. He could have chosen that. But does the novel suggest that there is a choice? So uh, for our purpose as readers, we're not, we're not here to, to provide resolutions for any conflicts because that would be a sociological study and we're not sociologists, yeah? Uh, we are literary critiques. So as literary critiques, all you can do at the end of the day is um, uh, come up with statements about what the author that you are reading or authors that you are reading attempt to uh, propose through their narrative, right? So the author-defined social reality then becomes your primary focus. What is the author suggesting? So you've got two authors. One is a South African, another one is a Kuwaiti. One writes his memoir and shows us the bicultural identity. And another one writes a fictional uh, story. But for all you know, this fictional story is not unique. It's not, it's not altogether fictional, right? For all you know, there are individuals in this context because there are Filipino mates working in, in Middle East as there are Indonesian mates working in the Middle East. So, um, it, it, it's not unthinkable that such a situation could have happened, 
right? It could be based on uh, um, you know facts that he is cr creating this fictional character and a fictional narrative. But that that aside, what does the author seem to suggest? You as a reader, you get to probe that element. So that is as as um, deep as you get to go. The extent of your discussion is not to um, uh, suggest a solution or an answer, okay? Your, your place as readers is constantly to look at the text as a representation of the context, of what's happening in that context. So in the context of uh, Jose, his story is not the story of Kuwait and it's not the story of um, uh, Philippines. It is the story of the coming together of these two individuals from two different cultural backgrounds, and they created a third uh, an individual. And that third individual, like it or not, resides within a third space. So this is uh, um, uh, what scholars call the third space cult, uh, the third, um, third culture. Mm, good job. I, um, is it a is it Mumi Baba? No, no, not third space, but uh, uh yeah, third, third. there is a term. It's it was there and then just just disappeared. Third space, the third space, the third culture. Um, uh, culture. There's the word culture. Not not third space. Okay, I'll, it'll come back to me. Um, but th this is looking specifically at children uh, uh, from this context. Uh, Homi Baba called is third culture kid. Sorry, Dr. Rai. Yes. What was uh, it again? Yeah. TCK, third culture kids or third culture individuals. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, so that's, the, uh, uh, that's the situation that both Trevor and uh, Jose find themselves in. Homi Baba's third space looks more at hybrids, uh, those who, who migrated to a particular country and they are in this new land and, you know, that, that element of it. Uh, so, so the hybrid identity, it can be the hybrid caused by you living in a new land and, um, uh, and because of the uh, living in the new land, you find that your cultural sensibility when it meets the cultural sensibility of the society in which you are now living in, you have a kind of negotiation. There are certain things that uh, you may use uh, the main society's culture. You may live the culture of the society that you are living in. And then there are times that you dip into your own cultural sensibilities. So minorities in, uh, in Australia, in Canada, in Britain, in uh, the US um, especially, they do that. So at home, they have a kind of their own culture, yeah, their minority culture. But when they are in society, they they have their own uh, uh, assimilation of the, the society's culture. Uh, but the third the third culture kids, uh, um, at, at, there is a kind of polemic there, you know. So so there is a whole culture uh, that these children. Uh, have developed or, or are growing uh, with. So if that was the case, the question to ask both writers is, how far are the parents uh, responsible to help develop the third culture kids? So, you know, uh, you know, when Shah talked about how religion was important uh, and um, someone else said the same. Uh, I forget somebody else also said the same thing. But that the question that I'm I'm asking you all to probe is that what role does the parent or the guardian play in ensuring that these bicultural children grow up whole and grow up um, um, with a clear sense of identity? Um, uh, I miss. Uh, um, reading of it suggests, as a lot of you also, that Jose's story is bleak, like, like you know, except for maybe, um, you know, if you look good, because you're a mixed, uh, mixed blood 
uh, child, if you look good, that's your only selling point. Other than that, you don't have a sense of belonging. Nobody wants to um, recognize you as uh, as part of them. Um, so it's, it doesn't seem like a hopeful uh, scenario to be bicultural. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering what these two writers, so as, as readers, that's where we come in. Whatever text that you are reading, you're reading it and you're asking yourself the question, what does the storyteller, i.e. the writer, what, did, what is he or she proposing to me about this issue that I have chosen to talk about? So always keep that in the back of your mind. Don't just remain at the level of the story, at the level of the text. Go beyond that. Go to the uh, meso level and ask questions about what is the unsaid? What is the writer trying to propose in showing me this level of engagement with this story? Yeah. So you may you may probe into the themes of empowerment and disempowerment. You may probe into. I, I like this final thing that. Um, uh, uh, I mean, Shah talked about something and then uh, Ruby mentioned about space. So politics of space and, and how uh, every space also has a level of uh, social, uh, no, uh, power struggles, the engagement. Uh, so so some, some spaces are associated with the hierarchical uh, power, uh, within the hierarchical power structure, and some spaces are considered lesser. So... Um, cities, uh, um, you know, places, cosmopolitan, uh, uh, met metropolitan uh, centers, cities are given a higher recognition. Slums, squatters, um, they're not given that kind of uh, the level of um, recognition because people living there don't seem to hold power in society, right? So politics of space is also something that uh, definitely Trevor Noah plays with because in the, uh, the apartheid con context, the blacks, they were not just blacks, but they were also marginalized within certain areas. And Trevor has to travel through all that space to, to get a good job, to kind of uh, um, um, live well. The same with Patricia, the mother. What about Isa and Jose? Does he also have to go through, travel through that kind of uh, a journey to go from a, a space that is disempowered to a space that is more seen as more empowerment, uh, providing empowerment? So those are uh, potential uh, issues. Um, and then uh, uh, Salim talked about the blessing and the curse. So even a simple Google search, um, Please use Google Scholar, uh, not just Google uh, search, but use Google Scholar specifically. But if I if I used, uh, where, where was this? Um, so if I if I use um, you know the, the, the dichotomy, the binary between the curse and the blessing. You might find certain uh, discussions that is of relevance. So, uh, Salim, when you say that you are thinking of working on this, the very fact that uh, Trevor Noah's title uses the word crime. So instead of a curse, he's using the word crime because it, it, it is seen as a crime in that society. But in Jose's case, in his life, uh, born he, him being born is not a crime. But you're right, him being born is seen as a curse. So look at how, um, how the theme of uh, curse as, you know, the cursed child in um, uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, um, book. So that idea of being a curse is also a lead motif in literature, right? Uh, uh, just like you have the dichotomy of the chosen one, you also have the dichotomy of the cursed one. So, so what connotates the element of being the cursed child? What are, what are things that make somebody a cursed uh, um, individual in society? It also ties up to what Ruby was talking about earlier, which is the, the misrecognition. I choose to misrecognize you 
I choose to identify you as someone who does not belong, who does not have the, the authority, the power, uh, uh, who is disempowered, who does not hold a status in society, very much like a paria in the context of uh, uh, the untouchables uh, in the Indian caste system. So being born a curse may be because you are born to a particular caste, but it, in, in Jose's case, it's not because of that. It is because, I think largely also, uh, 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 I always get the surname mixed up, Al Sanusi's uh, um, narrative appears to propose also that it's lack of parental uh, involvement because the parents are not involved in the raising of the child. So it's not like the child is cursed because you know, uh, like Damien, you know, he's like like the son of, of the devil or something like this from uh, what's his name's um, novel. Um, uh, is it Stephen, uh, Stephen King? Um, I can't remember, but that element of curse. So the word curse, I feel, Salim, is a little bit too strong because if he was a curse, that means he brings misfortune to people around him. Um, so I feel like maybe you want to rethink the idea of being a curse because uh, um, that, that has different associations. So think about what the writer uh, Saud al-Sanusi is trying to propose with regards to Jose and then look at Trevor Noah's experience and how he seemed to have... Um, made a life for himself despite being bicultural and, and despite his bicultural identity being seen as a crime in that society. And yet he seemed to have grown up whole, yeah, more, more whole, more, more complete in his sense of identity and belonging than Jose or Isa. So look at the tension and ask yourself, what does the writer of uh, The Bamboo Stop, what is he trying to propose? What is missing in Jose's life that perhaps Isa's, uh, sorry, perhaps Trevor Noah's life, um, despite the lack of parent, uh, father's involvement, he is still able to live a more complete life. Uh, so that is my suggest suggestion for Salim. Um, and I like what Lisa said, the idea of taking one's power uh, by taking one's name. Uh, so, so the question is, Lisa, does the power uh, reside only in your first name or does it also reside in your surname, your family name, right? So you may know your name, i.e. your first name, but if your surname is not uh, um, recognized or if the community or the society or even the family does not recognize your surname, um, does that have the, the same level of um, power, you know? So, so Isa does uh, take back his name, but does that taking back of name also give him a kind of appeasement, a kind of satisfaction, you know? Or is he still feeling that conflict, the turmoil? So what is the writer proposing? So always always come back to that. I want you to constantly remember that we are not doing a sociological study. We're not trying to answer some social ailments that's happening in society through literature, but we are making certain uh, statements that the author is suggest suggesting based on the uh, story that they are telling. Uh, I guess that's it. Any questions? Doctor, actually not a question, but I think what you said about uh, the surname part, I didn't think of surnames. I think I thought of like the first name. But if what you said like is right, if uh, taking the surname is also a form of taking power, does that mean like the married woman, you know when uh, uh, particularly when women married uh, non-Muslims, they take on their husband's name. So does that mean we're taking power away from those women? Muslims can relate, but yeah. Yeah. But uh, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I think culturally, um, you know, when, when, um, when I first found out about that and a friend of mine, uh, you know, 
from school, from when I was in school, when I first found out that she is no longer Wong Lai Fong, uh, and she is Lee Lai Fong, I was like, that is bizarre. Because her first name is Lai Fong, and she's married to somebody, uh, his surname is Lee. So she's taken, so, so I've always been writing her name as Wong Lai Fong, and to write her name as Lee Lai Fong, to me, it's like a, a whole different person. And that is me as an outsider. What about her? But because it's a cultural, um, it, it is something that you grow up with, uh, in their context, perhaps it's a given. Perhaps we can ask uh, uh, Dong Lai, um, how, uh, um, what's your surname? Uh, Alice, what's your surname? Uh, Dr. My surname is Ren. Ren. Yeah. So, so um, uh, when you get married, you will have your surname changed, right? Actually, no, doctor. Nowadays, we don't have our surname changed. Yeah. But that means it's not uh, it's not expected of you. So it's a choice. Oh yes. So your mom has a different surname, and your dad has a different surname. Yes. Cool. So you are taking your father's surname. Uh, surname, huh? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, in China, uh, we always take take a uh, father's surname, but yeah. uh, there is a a a, a, diff, a different uh, situation uh, that uh, uh, someone can take their mother's surname. Uh, it's a uh, it's like uh, we call Ru Zhui in Chinese. Uh, it's like uh, <laughs> you, your mother marry your father uh, and, uh, and your father go to your mother's uh, family to live together <laughs> yeah i listed them and uh, the, the husband is marrying in the house of the wife okay but but it is yeah. accepted culturally is accepted or it is a taboo uh it's uh, uh this happened because uh, uh the mass family is very poor and uh, and the women, the women's family is uh, rich, so, so yeah. Mm, okay, so so it's it's more a matter of class. So so there's this level of class uh, distinction also. So yeah, okay. So that's not just culture, but it is also a uh, um, class. Yeah, but yeah, even but add, doctor, uh, I, I do. Uh, I mean, I did learn now that I know. Uh, but I did find it rather fascinating because um, uh, in our community, um, family name is not something that we put a heavy uh, focus on. You know, so be be because because I'm a teacher, I teach teenagers. So every time I ask them, you know, um, uh, you know, like, you know, uh, like you know, like simple family topics, and they will say it is very important because most of them are Chinese. So they will say we need someone to pass down the bloodline. Mm. So we need someone to pass on the family line. So I mm. always like, what do you mean by this? I think mm. it's very important, you know. So to have grandparents, uh, grandchildren following the, the name, we must take care of the name. And, but because for us, maybe because we live in our own shelter privilege, we don't see the heavy uh, focus on, on like things like Ng or Tan or Li. But for them, it means something. Because for us, you know, uh, it is, it's a father's name. It's a father's name. And then, you know, then our children will have another surname. Then our children will have another surname. So I do find it really, really fascinating. I think it's a Muslim thing, but no, it's actually it's a Malay thing uh, because Arabs, they have their own surnames. Yep. And, it, and it, in Indonesia, some individuals only have one name. Yep. Yeah, there's no Binti or Bin. So I do find it very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyone else has any takes uh, based on what we... Uh, Salim, did you want to say something? Yeah, you got your hands Dr. raised. Salam. Doctor, sorry. Yeah. I agree with you completely what you said, Doctor, concerning the term yes. cares. 100% I'm with you. Mm. But if you look closely to, if you go, you know, between lines, if you read between lines, we will find that uh, the, the Trevor Mother was about to be killed and to be sentenced because of giving birth of a, a, a child with a different color mm -hmm. and at the same time goes back to Isa uh, the, 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 the grandmother Ghanima said you are not a blessing to the family mm -hmm. 
and I, I have I have read uh, I, I concentrate on that you know many times mm. and I came to something very interesting uh, the writer said something so nice let me let me just give you the the the, uh, the, the main idea of them he said each tree has it has a specific special type of soil to grow in it and has a special environment has a special weather tropical plants never grow in uh, in, in deserts i mean hot weather like kuwait and iraq so go back to iraq uh, the oak trees never grow in the southern parts of iraq and palm trees never grow in uh, areas uh, in, in in north area north of iraq where am i so uh, you you can't find palm trees in my area in the hook uh, in in mosul sorry so never grow that and if you apply the same thing to on human beings you'll find the same thing i know a man got married to a lady from the southern parts of Iraq. And they are both Muslims. But at the same time, they got divorced at, after two, three years. Why is that? Because the each, each plant, each tree has a specific atmosphere, context. You can't plant palm trees in the north, which the weather is very cold. So uh, this just I want to say that I'm 100% with you, Doctor. Curse is a very tough word, but mm. help me to find something relevant to that, Doctor. Thank mm. you so much, Doctor. So I think I think you've got. So if you put it on a continuum, you've got a blessing, you've got a curse, and you've got a crime. So I think if you put it all like that, um, between a crime, which is uh, um, in a civil society, if you do something against uh, uh, the rule of law, it is seen as, you know, you've committed a crime, right? But so when you talk about a curse and a blessing, there is that level of relationship with uh, the, the higher being that you are incorporating into the discussion, right? So. Uh, I think we want, I would like you to probe into this a little bit more so that your methodology is a little bit more objective rather than, uh, I agree with you what the grandmother says kind of helps, uh, helps you identify a potential theme uh, in, this, uh, in this story. But I'm also wondering, does the mother see uh, Isa or Jose as a curse? Just like does Patricia see Trevor as a crime. She understands this is what society says, but does she look at her son as a crime? She doesn't, right? So just right, like... Doctor. Sorry, doctor. You, you, you are right. The, the, grand, uh, uh, the granny, uh, Ghanima, she doesn't... Uh, uh, oh, she's, let's say she didn't say it's a crime. It's not a crime. Mm. It's not a crime for a man in Iraq or in another country to get married to another person uh, from another nationality. It's not a crime, but it's a curse. Mm. Yes, doctor. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I understand. I understand. Ruby, did you want to say something? Oh, I feel to I I I feel uh, uh I get uncomfortable with the word curse because you because it puts the burden on the child. Uh, and I'm very uncomfortable with that. I think mm -hmm. us as scholars and uh, thinkers, and I think most of us are educators in some way. Uh, I think we have a duty to not, uh, yes, to not direct that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we. Uh, I think replacing that, or if mm -hmm. if the term can be investigated and then replaced uh, mm -hmm. in a in a more humane term. I'm sure there is one like the. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. other words, or maybe third culture, like you said just now, will be better. But I do mm -hmm. find curse carries a very heavy baggage, and yeah. that is fair to children. Yeah. But 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 you see, the point being, because we are not, I completely agree with you, which is why I feel I feel the same. 
But I think at the end of the day, we are not doing a sociological study. Right? We're not going out there, we're not interviewing these children and then branding them whether they are crimes, they are born as a crime or born as a curse or born as a blessing. We're not doing that. But we're looking, we are investigating what the writer himself is suggesting. So Salim is right in saying that you know the grandmother is given that voice, and her in her voice, she is branding uh, Isa's birth as a curse. But my question is. Uh, Salim, you cannot stop there. You need to probe and look at how Isa's sense of identity is accepted by the other members of society, by Isa's mom, by Isa's dad, the grandmother for sure, and other paternal, maternal uh, aunts and uncles and parents. Likewise, you do the same with Trevor's context, right? How the grandmother... Uh, the grandmother doesn't really accept Trevor as one of her grandkids. She is mindful of her treatment of Trevor. She, she doesn't treat Trevor like uh, she treats her other grandchildren. There is a kind of a distance that she places between her and Trevor. So if you accept that person as your own, uh, you will treat them exactly how you will treat the other grandkids. So in that sense, Jose's grandmother is treating him exactly the same as Trevor's grandmother treats him. There is a kind of a distancing uh, involved. Uh, Jose's uh, grandmother distances herself by using this kind of uh, uh, strategy, if you want to call that, uh, by branding uh, him as a curse. Where else uh, Trevor's grandmother she does not dare uh, to lift her hand uh, on him and, and punish him physically because she feels that she can be convicted if anything happens to him. So there is that level of the crime factor. So what I would like to suggest, uh, Salim, is for you to probe not just at the grandmother's uh, level, look at the other characters and look at how Jose himself views his birth. How in eventually, because so then you can say this is what Saud Al Sanusi is proposing uh, with regards to Jose's uh, story, the the bicultural uh, product uh, that is Jose, that at the level of uh, grandparents and parents and and Jose, there is a level of acceptance or or distancing or misrecognition even right, at the societal level, and the same with Trevor. So then you can compare the bicultural experience uh, presented in uh, Born a Crime as well as in the bamboo stalk, right? So if we just take the curse, we are, we are, we are stopping at the grandmother's um, um, labelling of Isa. So we need to probe further than that. And then you will have a more collective sense of uh, um, hybrid identity. And, and you know, that the idea of each tree, you know, it has to have a special soil to grow. Um, you know, I was just, I'm a coffee drinker. So I'm just Googling, like, where was coffee originally from? It, it's, you know, and, and the fact that you don't need, it to grow in your backyard to be able to enjoy certain things. So, so likewise, you have greenhouses. People are installing greenhouses to be able to grow uh, the things like, you know, maybe strawberries and stuff like that, that you might not be able to grow in a hot climate like Malaysia. And my PhD student who since uh, finished the studies um, uh, looked at grafting uh, as a kind of... Um, identity development and how grafting when you graft a plant you take an aspect of another plant and you plant it you 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 impose it on another plant grafting let me just google that so that i can talk about it better um, so so um uh, my phd student completed her thesis looking at um among other things the bamboo stalk so this idea of grafting is part of the horticultural uh, technique in which, um, let's look at an image, huh? in which, you know, you, you, 
you strategically bring uh, two different plants and you make them uh, grow together. You know, you you uh, you create this technique, and this is something that has been has been in practice in the horticultural industry. Yeah. So you may have uh, like tomatoes or apple with pear or, or different kind of a variety of oranges and, and even uh, uh, in um, breeding amongst animals, right? Uh, in this kind of a concept where you bring a different plant and you, you um, um, consciously put it into another plant and make it grow into another third uh, product. So it's in a sense, it's like a bicultural identity, you know, when uh, uh, you think about it and how does that plant thrive in which, in, in which environment does that plant thrive in? Uh, and you, you may also have a, a kind of a sense of acceptance or not acceptance, especially with regards to animals, if you do things like that with animals, right? Uh, are they able to thrive? So those kinds of issues can also be um, uh, problematized. But with regards to what Salim was saying, I think I feel we need to probe the story further uh, in order to be able to get a more complete sense of what uh, Saud Al Sanusi is proposing uh, with his story. Yeah. So because if we leave it as as a blessing or a curse. It is almost like saying these are the only two options. So if you're neither a blessing nor a curse, then where are you? Right? So if in Isaac's case, he is not seen as a blessing, but he is also not seen as a curse by the whole family, maybe just the grandmother. So then where does that leave him? Right? So yeah, Salim, you want you want to um, say something more? Yes, doctor. Sorry. Just I remembered in Kurdish society, we have the same idea. Uh, as uh, Saud al Sanusi said, it is said that in Kurdish society, the kids of gypsy, uh, I mean, I mean, people who are, uh, you can see in many can, poor countries who are begging for money, food, and blah, blah, things like that. He, it is said that kids of gypsy cannot be uh, uh, kids of, uh, of, uh, of we say aga aga it means just like a head of a tribe. Mm. You got my point, doctor. Yeah. So yeah. He said. He said. Uh, uh, even if a girl from Gypsy got married to uh, uh, the head of the tribe, so she will she will behave the same as a Gypsy kids. Mm. Thank you, doctor. Mm. Got it. Okay. Uh, anyone else has anything uh, to add to the discussion today? Uh, sorry, doctor. Uh, Go ahead. When talk to the curse, uh, it's a very serious and a tough word. And uh, I will not use the curse, I will use a welcoming situation. Not welcoming situation. Mm -hmm. This happened in China. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, it's not. Uh, it's not about race, but about gender. Yeah, uh, because you know we have a one child po one uh, one child policy in China before. Uh, maybe uh, it's uh, where where I was born. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, 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 I was born in nineteen ninety six. Yeah. So, uh, so. If uh, the first uh, the only child is boy, it's okay. But mm. uh, if the only child is girl, it's like uh, not welcoming situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the the older generation uh, who has uh, who have a very strict strict mind about the <coughs> gender, uh, 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 highlight the family line. So mm. they they love boys. So when they heard that uh, is a girl uh, mm. it's very disappointed um, mm. most of my uh, uh, female classmates uh, suffered this but uh, I, I first uh, uh, the their grandmothers grandparents uh, didn't like them but uh, <laughs> when time flies they're forced to accept this uh, uh, this fact this 
So, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and uh, mm, the girls uh, are told that uh, uh, they they didn't like because they didn't like uh, them because uh, they are not uh, not good. So, so they uh, studied hard. Maybe they turn they turn their uh, at attitude yeah mm. yeah this i i, this I w- well said well said yeah gender is also something that is uh, uh you know is th- there's politics involved in um especially in communal societies with regards to the girl child compared to uh, the boy uh, child so i completely uh, agree with you and and that's why i think in our two novels gender is not an issue gender is not brought into the uh, the discussion because both in both stories it's the boy child so if if it had been a girl child uh, uh, that would have been another level of uh, the polemic would have been another at another level so well said i agree with you maybe i don't know i'm just thinking uh, what do you all think is there a level of shame involved Yes, I think. Because um, uh, in Jose's case, maybe the the Kuwaiti grandmother is ashamed that she has a, a grand grandson, even though it's a son, grandson, a grandson not from the Arab lineage. So, so there is that level of shame uh, that she uh, suffers. So instead of uh, accepting it of or uh, understanding that she's actually ashamed of the child or even her her son's uh, behavior she chooses to kind of distance herself from it and and uses the word curse but ultimately is that because you know when salim talked about a child being a blessing there is a level of um, uh, acceptance or celebration that comes with the birth of a child right but when you are not able to celebrate that, it can be uh, a few reasons that's causing it. And one of which could be because of you are ashamed uh, of the birth of that child, right? Uh, that, that sense of shame, it could, it could be because, that, you know, from a different nationality, from a different culture, from, from a, uh, um, an, an inferior uh, class, Right, uh, that again is a theme that transcends various literatures. Okay, this class idea of the class um, um, class based relationship. You know, the the son is sorry, the boy is from a different class, a higher class, a wealthier uh, class, and the girl is from uh, the the poorer class. You know, she's a maid. So if you think about it, in a communal society like the Arabs, like the, the Kuwaiti society, as well as in Malaysian society as well, and maybe Chinese society, marriage is not something to be taken lightly, right? The idea of getting married, uh, you, you basically marry two families, not just two individuals, but it's like two families coming together. So, but the way uh, Isa's father uh, went about it, uh, it disregards that tradition and the way the society works. So that is also another level of shame that the grandmother feels very strongly, perhaps. So I'm just, uh, Salim, you know, you may you may probe any of these lines, and, but we can talk more uh, in our consultation slots. So, so, you, uh, but I think these are these are good suggestions that your your classmates are are giving you. Okay, anyone I agree, with them, I agree with them. Shame is much better than than curse. Yeah. Thank you for all who said that. And I convinced now. Now I will change it. Giving birth between shame and blessing is much better and uh, is more suffer than than curse. Thank you, Doctor. But but you can bring in your analysis that excerpt from the grandmother you can you can bring that in and probe that and, and and look at that as well don't don't disregard that yeah inshallah doctor inshallah any anyone else has any other comments or or um, further ideas that you want to probe with regards to these two books 
Uh, I think somebody mentioned nationhood. Uh, I cannot remember who it was. Uh, but yeah, but yeah, but uh, based on our discussion, I I feel like uh, in our person, this happens in our real life as well. In our pursuit of nationhood and to belong, I wonder um, there are people who fall between the cracks or mm. into the cracks, and then there are people who are being made invincible, no, invisible, uh, mm. because it's not some. Because I am privileged enough not to have experienced that, because I guess. You know, I was born to both to parents who are both Malays, both Kelantanese Malay. So there was not even a confusion and purity. Um, unfortunately, like you know, you know, this purity of blood. We thought it's fiction, but actually, we probe into our you know familial history. It is something that all of us have considered: Are you full Malay or are you full Chinese? What mix are you? And it has also gotten into our lingo as well. Oh, you know, uh, budak budak kacukan is the mm. Malay term that you call it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it 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 gives me um, uh, a reflection, a reflectionary perspective on how I view things. But uh, yeah, but very cautiously because from a from a privileged standpoint, I must mm. admit. Mm. Um, yeah. Again, that theme is uh, is also very uh, significant in literature. If you, any Potterheads will know the half blood, right? The half blood print. So, so the idea of the half blood, the Muggles are are basically, you know, the 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 weaker weaker um, creatures, right? And and that idea of being pure this or or pure that 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 is also something that is probed in literary uh, uh, discourses. In stories, in narratives. So yeah, you're right. I I I I like that, and that's partly why the, the these two texts were chosen for you to kind of look at identity is no longer one thing or another, right? So we looked at um, okay, if I can just sum up the kind of text and the issues that we talked about. Uh, we we started off looking at uh, this sense of identity politics uh, based on. Um, text produced from a particular uh, literary canon. So you've got that binary. We, we looked at uh, Langston Hughes' I2, and then we also looked at um, um, Telephone Conversation by uh, Wole Soyanka, looking at the black and white. So you're either this or you're that. And then you come full circle to the last two texts that we're doing uh, this week, which is an identity that is neither this nor that, right? So, so what happens to those individuals who don't belong in one or another? What, what stories do you get from them? And, and where would their stories fit within the uh, canon of, of text being produced? So for instance, uh, the bamboo stalk, will you consider this as a Kuwaiti novel? Will you consider this as um, a, a diasporic writing? Will you consider this as what, what canon will it come under? The fact that it won the International Prize for Arabic Fiction already indicates that it's given that space of recognition, right? So I remember somebody asking, like, if, if the writer is not Malaysian, but the writer writes about Malaysia, can that writing be seen as a Malaysian text? You know, my answer is no. I'm, I'm quote unquote being a purist in that sense because I feel that I need to celebrate the Malaysian writer as much as I celebrate the Malaysian writing, right? Uh, so, so if you are writing about a text that is set in a, another context, will this, the text be in the canon of where you are from or the canon in which that text is being produced? So those are issues that I feel comparative literature has not uh, sufficiently probed. And that's where your participation can come in. So if we looked at the 20th century school of comparative literature, and then we've moved to the 21st century, there is a kind of black and white categorization, right? Um, uh, previously, it used to be a very Eurocentric, Euro-American centric, the Anglo-American school. And then in the 21st century, you see uh, uh, comparative literature from other schools outside the centers, the cosmopolitan centers, the metropolitan centers. They are also incorporated as your first assignment has shown. 
right? So you've got different definitions of comparative literature, maybe from the Indian school, from the Chinese school or other parts of the world. But now we are also probing in terms of the, the text selection. Which text can you choose? Uh, um, uh, how do you make the selection, right? So today's uh, discussion, I think, um, opens up a little bit. However, I did not bring in diasporic writing. So I would say that would be the limitation of our discussion for this course. We did not probe into diasporic writers' representation of a particular identity, right? So for instance, uh, uh, Malaysian diasporic writers, I did not incorporate that in. Maybe next semester when we are looking at Malaysian literature in English, for those of you who have not done Malaysian literature in English, Lisa, you're more than welcome to, to sign for that if you're interested. We've enjoyed having you in class today, uh, this week, and, and this entire semester. So, so when do we look at Malaysian literature in English, and if your final project you choose to look at diasporic Malaysian writers, you may do that. But for my take, when I make selections of texts, I will choose writers who are from this literary canon, right? So the writers that I choose are those who I feel represents a particular literary canon. But for your final project, I'm going to allow you to probe into your own definition of how you see comparative literature, your definition, and how you make that selection. Right, so uh, uh, Salim was saying he's going to look at the Arabic version of the bamboo stock. Uh, Shah was saying she's looking at a movie version, uh, a movie, uh, and to compare that with uh, a text. So each of you will have your own um, understanding of comparative literature. But what I hope is that at the end of this semester, having read all the journal articles and then uh, uh, the novels and the texts that we have read, having listened to your friends' um, discussion uh, various, at, at various uh, juncture of our semester, I hope you, you leave with a sense of understanding the breadth and the depth that comparative literature can offer you, right? And it also gives you a kind of a methodology. So when I'm approaching my research, I need to approach it according to the, the focus and the scope. So if I say comparative literature, then I need to make sure the two texts are, number one, not from the same literary canon, right? I cannot choose a text from one race and another, one uh, ethnic background and another ethnic background from the same nation. You cannot do that because that's not comparative literature. So those are the, the fine, subtle lines that you need to understand in order for you to say, I'm, I'm, I have a sense of understanding what is comparative literature. So the definition, the methodology, the choice of text. But at the end of the day, we are taking a more uh, open approach. The readers has a say. Each of you if, you, if you think about it, each of the reader in this class has a say in terms of how you approach the analysis. I did give you parameters, like for instance, this week's parameter was on biculturalism, but not everybody wanted to look at bicultural identity as their parameter, and that's okay too, right? You may, you may want to probe uh, uh, this discussion, uh, for instance, Alice talked about the inequality, uh, uh, Ruby talked about uh, denunciation of uh, by the other. So that doesn't mean it has to be bicultural. It can be any text and that issue will still be relevant. Yeah. So, uh, so I hope that uh, the experience of this course has kind of enriched your reading of literature and your understanding of uh, how important your role as readers are, you know, and your roles as uh, your individual role as a reader as well as your horizon of expectation as a reader enriches your reading. So the more you read, the more you, you live, the more you are able to look at the text and say, there is something here that I want to speak about. And that's where I join this conversation, right? So I, I, hope, I hope the class has, has this particular course has uh, provided you those um, um, enrichment. And I look forward to reading your final project. 
um, before we, we conclude this course. But in the meantime, we've got a few weeks before uh, your assignment is due. So please do sign up uh, for consultation. Let me know when you want to see me uh, and, and we will take it from there. Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, the class quickly uh, from uh, Dong Lai. Alice, uh, do you have any, any final thoughts for your classmate as a whole since we're all here together? Or for me? <laughs> thank you, Dr. Hers, and thank you, my classmates. I really uh, learned a lot from this class. Yeah, we, before uh, this class, um, when I was reading story, and uh, you know I'm, I'm not... Uh, uh, I did a major in literature when I was an uh, undergraduate. So uh, story is just a story for me, yeah, before mm. this class, yeah. So this, uh, and uh, when we talk, uh, when we talk about uh, the novels, uh, the journals, uh, it's like, uh, especially novel, it's like, uh, I, it's like, uh, I see uh, another, person's life yeah it's uh he's uh, far away far away from um, my horizon but uh yeah yes i live his life yeah i i've enjoyed your your presentations uh over the last two semesters um, um alice uh, I, I would say, you know, one thing I liked about your take was you have a very poetic way of looking at the world and, and very poetic way of expressing your ideas. So I don't know it's because of the Mandarin that you translate when you translate from Mandarin into English, it comes across more poetic, you know, but, but I like the phrasing, the way you phrase certain things, it's very poetic. So I think... Uh, even if your undergraduate was, was, I think it was business English, was it? Yes, doctor. Yeah. So even if it's a, a very dry subject like business English, um, but I think, uh, I think it's already there in you uh, that, that looking at uh, the world from that kind of um, figurative expressions, you know, and I think that's the strength that we need when we're talking about literature. So you're right, story is just a story and you're reading a story of somebody who is distant from you. So how do you bring that story close to you? That's the empathy that you, you connect with the, the character and the writer. Yeah, so thank you so much for that. Uh, Aimee? Um, I, when I was young, I always watched a lot of book tubes at YouTube and I always interest, I'm always interested in the books people read, but I never get into that community. So having like a book review weekly like this, it actually, I, I really enjoy it because I always like to discuss, especially after I watch a movie, I always like to discuss in detail about the movie critically, but now we're doing this in books. I very enjoy it very much because everyone has different takes in how uh, in how they read the same material. So I, I really appreciate that. And I also find that everyone in this um, class actually inspires me to be more mature because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because um, when I hear everybody's um, ideas or thoughts of or takes in the in the same material that we're reading they sound everyone sounds so intelligent that i'm i aspire to be like everyone so yeah i i really enjoy this course a lot okay thank you for introducing me to book two i just googled it i did not know of this existence of this thing called book two so i will be checking it out guess what i'll be doing uh this weekend then uh so yeah thank you for that <laughs> Uh, but but I, 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 you, you will be surprised if you go through the recordings of this particular course the last few uh, weeks. All of you sound intelligent, you know. So I think you're right. We, we bring our A game when we are in a company of A players, you know. So, so, but, but the dynamics is that you don't feel insecure. The minute you feel insecure, you are, you are hesitant to share some of your ideas. But the camaraderie that, that you all have, um, I think it's a very healthy um, 
the fact that you all are not in the same room, but you bring that the energy that you bring to your your uh, class in this class situation, it's a very healthy one. So uh, all of you deserve a pat on the back. Go on, pat on the back. <laughs> you know, so so um, because I think it is as much as individuals as it is collective to create that energy and that, that camaraderie. So yeah, I miss point, uh, uh, well said. Uh, kudos to all of you. Uh, thank you so much, Aimee. Uh, Salim? Thank you so much, Doctor. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody. At the top of them, you, Doctor Raihana, thank you. Thank you. and uh, all other sisters. In fact, they gave me wonderful ideas. And your, uh, in fact, your ideas were the most wonderful for me. Inshallah, I'm, I, will, I will try to do my best to stick by all of what you said, Doctor. Thank you so much, sisters. Inshallah. Thank you so much, uh, Salim. Sure. Um, yeah, first of all, um, I like that this class is challenging to me, actually, um, because we don't just dive in theories, you know, like any of the classes. Like, I'm not saying that it's not good, of course it is, but yeah, um, this class is more of like, you know, we dive in in our thoughts and opinions, and, and that is very much, you know, tell, it's very telling of who, I mean, who we really are in some ways and, and yeah. what you hold on to yeah. and stuff like that. And I'm very thankful that I read Cops Washer <laughs> because I really like it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really like it. And then, yeah, um, um, I want to thank everybody because um, all of you have helped me a lot in terms of like unpacking, like even a single sentence that I, that I you know, um, tell. Um, so, yeah, uh, I very much... I uh, want to thank Dr. Wright, of course, uh, for introducing a lot of, actually, um, you know, texts from Middle East, I would say, right? Middle East, right? Yeah. Um, because all my life, I've been re reading, like, since small, like, any blind burn, <laughs> you know, you'd be reading, like, yeah, very, very Western um, texts. Um, so, yeah, in this class, I'm, I'm very, you know, excited because, okay, next reading is, is from Middle East uh, writers. This is from, you know, um, so the, I like that we are exploring, you know, in terms of our reading and everything. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank Sean. you very much. Thank you. Lisa? Uh, right. Uh, same with uh, what Shah said. Uh, I actually enjoyed the variety of books that we read in our class because same. Even though I was a child, I was more exposed to like the Western books, Harry Potter, Artemis Fowl, and all that, rather than uh, rather than the Asian Asian books that we have. So I think yeah, that that's one of the things I'm very grateful for in this class. Uh, I also immensely enjoyed the weekly like, book discussions that we have. It's kind of a relaxing time for me, like to discuss, uh, which is funny because I mean I don't I, I I don't sound very intelligent in my head, you know. But but, but when I talk to you, uh, when, when I talk to the people in this class, I go like, wow, wow, she makes like they make a very interesting point. They have like such a broad perspective of the world, they might and how they interpret every day. But uh, yeah, I'm also uh, of course thank you, uh, thankful to, to Dr. Rahana and everyone here for uh, I guess for listening to what I have to say for all for the for the entire semester as well, and also the Imagine Community theory is something that I've adapted into my research as well. So with that said, I think it's interesting how an imagined community comes with its own set of imagined set of rules, which I think, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting thing for me because whether you are inclusive or exclusive part of that community, it depends on a lot of factors, your race, your religion, your age maybe. Yeah, so it leaves me a lot to, uh, to think about. Yeah, so thank you everyone. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, Ruby? I just would like to say those who say that they are not very intelligent presented on people like Freud and, uh, you know, all these uh, theories. And, you know, so those who say that they don't sound intelligent, I think, are the most intelligent people in this class. So that is the first rule about being intelligent. You don't say that you are intelligent. OK, but yes, but I do agree. I think all of us are astoundingly uh, how to say this, a sharp, I, I would like to say. And I think this has a lot to do with uh, Dr. Rai. I think you, uh, I think you help us 
in unpacking a lot of things, you do not make analysis a very scary thing. So I must mm-hmm. thank you for that because 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 I I you know my my head is a little bit scattered. I do read a lot, you know. You know so I absorb that, but I'm not sure mm-hmm. how to unpack that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think the way you approach um, literary analysis has been very inspiring for all of us. I think all of us share in that sentiment. Uh, so I hope the tools that you have given us, we can apply them correctly and consistently. I can only uh-huh. pray. Uh-huh. Uh, but yes, but thank you so much, Dr. Rai. I think, yeah. So uh-huh. I hope to see you next semester. Uh. Inshallah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, just, just to find uh, to finalize something that my, my, uh, my philosophy as a teacher is not to teach you one thing, but rather to find out what you are interested in. We'll read the same thing, but you, as Shah said, you know, and Shah and Lisa also said the same thing, that that you bring your interest in your in your uh, discussion, in your unpacking of the text. And my role is then to say, okay, you're interested in that, why don't you look at this thing? Maybe this concept might be suitable to you. So I feel like I'm more of a curator of, of the learning, your learning uh, pathways, rather than I say, this is the one thing we all have to learn together and this is the one thing we do together. But then, then it might not be of interest to you, right? So we all come from uh, different backgrounds, different uh, um, stations in life, right? But we have interests. And when we open a book, and find ourselves and the issue we are interested in in that book, that's the moment we come alive. So, so uh, what uh, um, was it? Was it Dong Lai who said this? That it's just a story and, and it's a story that is at a distance. But the minute you open that story and you find yourself in that story, the story suddenly comes up close and personal, right? So. The beauty of literary studies is it allows you that window into yourself, not just into that story, into what you feel you want to say something about. So I would like to uh, um, highly recommend that all of you take up every assignment that you are given for the literature uh, program. Take up that as an opportunity to say something about your own thoughts about that issue and then use the work of fiction as a way to express those ideas. So when you do that, at every juncture of your assignment, you are finding your voice. You are exploring further who you are as an individual. You know, So it's not the number of books that you read. It's the number of times you digest something and you have an opinion. That's why your e-task, I'm asking you to write a paragraph or so, but it has to be compact. You end with a thesis statement. What is this analysis about? You don't have to do the entire analysis, but I want you to at least have reached that level where you form an opinion about those two texts that you are reading. Not at the surface level, but to the level where you can develop a thesis statement. Right. So if you ever choose to probe that further for later publications, you can just pick that paragraph and say, run with it. You know, develop develop a whole full paper, but the e task is important for that. Okay, so it's been my pleasure uh, conducting this course. Uh, I honestly feel that all of you have uh, brought your e game, and I'm I, I feel privileged uh, to be to to be part of this. And and Thursday uh, afternoon, I would look forward to my class with you all. So it's it's going to be sad that it's it's the last class. But uh, inshallah, we will see uh, uh, each other next semester for Malaysian Literature and English. Some of you will be joining us. Um, uh, Dong Lai has done uh, Malaysian Literature and English, and uh, Fuzla has also completed Malaysian Literature and English. But I think inshallah, the rest of you, I will, I will see you next semester. We will do the same approach. Again, I will introduce you to different uh, writers, but it is still will be the same. You will get to say what you want to say about the text. Uh, and I'm not going to prescribe to you how to read a text because that's just not my my approach as a literature uh, teacher and a student of literature. Yeah. So thank you again, and please do sign up for consultation uh, for your final you for project. Thing, right. Uh, so so I look forward to seeing you inshallah for your final project. And and um, Dong Lai, uh, I will see you uh, for your final project. 
uh, and then um, you know inshallah all the best to your other courses as well okay thank you doctor thank you doctor okay thank you so care. much Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye